Please grab a seat. <clears throat> well, this morning we're uh, <clears throat> continuing our, our series in Colossians. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're awake now. Um, we're continuing in Colossians. So if you've got your Bibles or your phones, please uh, open up to Colossians 3, uh, verses 18. We'll be reading from very shortly. Um, but firstly, I'd like to recap some of the themes, you know, some of the journey that we've taken, some of the flow that Paul's taken this letter uh, to the church in Colossae. Um, remember the, the church in Colossae? Uh, Paul's writing to a church that he didn't start. You know, it's something that some of his ministry partners started, and he's writing to correct the false teaching that's going on in the area. Um, and he's writing to establish a firm foundation, a gospel-centered foundation with Jesus as Lord. Um, and he's writing to, to bring them to maturity. So they become a mature church uh, who represents Jesus, a healthy church, a vibrant church, a church uh, that is fulfilling the mission in the city of Colossae. <clears throat> so in Colossians 1, Paul talks about the supremacy of Christ. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, he talks about the revealed mystery. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, he talks about how we now have freedom from legalism, from the human rules, because of Christ's work. Uh, 2.13 says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that are to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So there's, no, there's freedom from human rules, but there is a, a new way of living when we accept Jesus. Chapter 3 says, Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds, sorry, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And a bit further down he says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience, all those fruits of the Spirit. And then we arrive at today's passage. Today's passage is really practical, which I love. But it needs to be, be read in context of putting Christ at the center. Everything in our lives is directed towards Jesus, and this is now the outflowing of healthy relationships. So we're going to be looking at our earthly relationships which come out of the transformation that Christ brings within, the, within us. Looking at the relationship between husbands and wives, between parents and children, and between masters and slaves. So Colossians 3, verses 18 to 4, 1. Let's read together. Wives, submit to your husbands. Submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, as if working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward for it. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. There is no favoritism. Masters, provide for your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. <clears throat> now I'd like to do a little exercise together. So will you step into this with me? Um, I'd like you to picture a fictitious Aussie family. So I'm not talking about your family. If I am talking about your family, maybe the Holy Spirit's trying to say something, but we're picturing a fictitious Aussie family. Hopefully they're a little bit relatable. Um, so we have Kevin. Uh, he's an accountant for a government department. He's been in that, you can make up the department. Uh, he's been there for 25 years. You know, he's got a new boss, and the boss doesn't know what he does, so he just lets Kevin do whatever Kevin needs to do and work away. Uh, Kevin's uh, married to Sandra. Sandra is in marketing. She used to work for a big firm and has just started her own agency. She's just stepped out on her own, and it's busy. So she's just taken on a, a fresh grad, and she's employed a couple of students to help her with some of the projects that are going on. They have two children. 
Uh, there's Jasmine, who's 17, and Connor, who's 14. Uh, Jasmine uh, wants to go to parties. She's very popular at school, uh, very outgoing, and her parents have said, no, you can't go to parties. Uh, Connor, 14-year-old boy, he spends most of his time in his room playing Xbox when his parents manage to drag him out of his room. Uh, he sits there on his phone scrolling through TikTok and Snapchat. So have you got this picture of, of the family? Can anyone relate to any of any? <clears throat> So what I'd like you to do, um, as we reread this, just have a think about one of the characters. Pick one person and read it from their perspective. You know, a, a, a dad who's working in a job, who doesn't have a, um, a boss who's really giving him much oversight. Uh, a mum who's doing a lot in her business and her career right now. She's very full and she's got some, some interns and some, some fresh grads working for her. Uh, and two teenagers uh, who are battling with the, the different tensions and struggles with their parents. So have a think about one of those people, and let's reread this verse again. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to carry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. There is no favoritism. Masters, provide for your slaves what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now, what stands out for your character? For that person you chose? Was it Kevin? Was it Sandra? Was it Jasmine? Was it Connor? What would they have got from the verse? This really practical verse as they sat around the, the dining room table on a Saturday morning and read that together. Well, I want to suggest that we, we'll pick up on, on uh, Jasmine's perspective, just one of them, but... Um, she may read that very differently to her brother. She may read that very differently to her mum. So there's two ways that she, I think she could read it. Um, she could see the line that says, I need to obey my parents, and go, wow, that's, that's corrective. I really need to obey my parents. That's the Holy Spirit working within me. Or she might see the line in there. Can anyone think of the line she might see? Fathers, do not embitter, do not provoke your children. She might see that line instead and go, wow, isn't, isn't dad just the worst? You know, mum's mom, working all the time, now dad's trying to parent us, and it's not going that well. Can you see how we can read our context and our situations into the practical verses of Paul? And it's not necessarily wrong to do. The Holy Spirit uses scripture uh, to convict us and to correct us. But that's not what Paul is talking about. I want to get to the underlying principle, which then brings out how, how, the, how Jasmine, how Kevin, how Sandra should behave in a healthy family dynamic. So we need to come back to, to Paul's foundation, that what he set up in the, in the rest of Colossians, that Jesus is Lord. He is the supreme one, and everything in our life is directed from him. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us, and also what he's doing within us. So now having set our hearts on things above, we have taken off our old ways, you know, maybe thinking that dad's wrong, and we've put on the new ways of going, you know, how can I contribute? What, what, is it, what is it that needs to be transformed within me? We've put on the new ways, we've clothed ourselves with all those fruits of the Spirit, there's an internal transformation, Jesus is working on us, and as he works on us, He's letting that flow out into the relationships, those, those relationships which are closest to us, um, our family, our friends, our colleagues, those that we have some influence over. See, this is not a new set of rules. We can very easily see this as a new set of rules that Paul's laying down, but he's just spent a whole chapter saying it's not about rules. So we'd be slipping straight back into legalism. What Paul's talking about is a change of heart, letting Jesus change our hearts, so that we have the right posture and perspective to take into our earthly relationships. Max Anders says this, 
this, this passage, this summary of it is genuine spiritual living is bringing relationships, that's all our relationships, into compliance with the example of Christ. It's bringing our relationships into Christoformity, as, as a lot of other scholars say. It's not just the relationship with our spouse, it's not just the relationship that we have with Jesus, but it's all of our relationships, all of our earthly things. They flow out of what Jesus is doing within us. Paul's reframing the relationships based on Jesus as Lord and King of our lives, Jesus as the dominant relationship in our life. It's not our family as the dominant influence and then that, that sort of says how we worship Jesus. It's Jesus as the dominant influence which then affects how we live in our family or how we work. Um, something else to note, and that this is a very different context to us. It's also a very different context to Jesus' context, the Jewish context. If Paul was writing this to a group, group of Jews, you know, the church in Jerusalem, he's got so many examples that he could pull from the Old Testament of really good ways to be a parent, really horrible ways to be a parent, really amazing ways to, to treat your slaves and not. He's also got all of the wisdom literature, you know, all, of the, all of the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes which, which speak about how to have a, a long life and to, to have, the ch- have children that cherish you. So if you're speaking to a Jewish audience, he's got lots of material, but he's not. He's speaking to a Roman audience, and their context is very different. I really wish I had time to go into what Roman households looked like in the first century. I, mean, I find it fascinating, and you know, some of you may find it fascinating too. Um, I'll put something in the Belong Group resources if you would like to have a read this week. Um, But the Roman household had a male figurehead. They had complete authority. Households had a male head, his wife, his children, his slaves, as well as their families. So you can see this is, it's not just uh, a, a nuclear family of four or five or seven people, all from from you know, one set of parents. This is multiple families all living in a much larger residence and all the complexities that come along with that. As the slaves have this read out, they go, well, I'm a slave, but I'm also a father. So how does that work? I've got a, you know, two of these apply to me. And so the complexities of human relationship come through as well. But the wife had to legally submit to the husband. The children were essentially property of the husband as were the slaves. Children are only slightly above slaves. And so you've got um, a a hierarchy with the man at the head and everyone else subject to his authority. So in this section, Paul is is speaking to the context. And he's not not saying, hey, we're revolutionaries, we're going to completely upend society. No, he's saying, you work within the context, but I'm going to reframe it. Actually, now where, there is a, where you have power, you have to wield power like Jesus. So you now have an obligation. Ephesians 5 and 6 takes these same verses and unpacks it over a, a much larger section. So if you want to explore that, Ephesians 5.22 onwards. So Paul is, is saying that where you have power, you now have a responsibility. He confirms that Christianity is not otherworldly. It's not all spiritual and when you become a Christian you can just run away from your responsibilities. You don't have to engage in society. That may have been what the mystics in Colossae thought. He establishes that the new Christian life when Christ is in us changes how we interact with those closest to us, with those who see us every day. Christianity begins in the home. When we wield power, Whatever our dynamic, whether we're a boss or whether we're a parent, we wield power in the way that Jesus would wield power. And it's through love. Ephesians 5 talks about mutual submission. And so when we get to the slaves, the slaves are submitting to their master, but actually the master's got responsibilities to his slaves as well. And so we can see this is a, a beautiful picture of what a healthy and mature Christian community could look like living in a very hierarchical society. We don't have that same hierarchy today, but we do have relationships, and we do have people who we have some influence or power over, and we do have people who are in positions of of authority or power over us. And so this section can speak to our relationship with them. I'll remind you again, Max Anders says, genuine spiritual living 
is bringing relationships into compliance with the example of Christ. Um, Heidi read before um, Philippians 2. I'll just, just take you back there again. Philippians 2 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if there's any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you looking to the interests of others. If you read that section, is that the, the husband, the wife, the slave, the master, the child, are they looking to their own interests? Or are they looking to how they fit within this relational system, the interests of others? Verse 5, the famous one says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He had all the authority. He was the supreme one. He was the very nature God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so as I, I read these, the, the Spirit just reminded me of, of humility, this, this need to, to mutually submit within our relationships but it, it's from a posture of humility. It's, it's Jesus within us that then flows out to those around us. That's Christ's example. If we're Christians, we've got the Holy Spirit living within us. We're being formed more and more into the image of Christ. So how does that play out in our relationships? Now, why do you think Paul is talking about this? Yes, he's, he's addressing some some false teaching, maybe some, some, something to do with the mystics. Um, but I think it's, it's because of his goal. His goal is to have a church that is mature. This is what a mature church looks like when, when people are, uh, have Jesus as the central relationship and then the other relationships conform underneath Jesus. Each person playing their role, but it's all under the headship of Jesus. It's all about the health and the maturity of the household, the health and maturity of the household. Um, as we look at what Paul describes, I think it seems pretty good. Uh, if everyone's a Christian, then that could function really well. If everyone's not a Christian, you know, this actually becomes an evangelism opportunity because people in the household go, you know, I, I treat you this way and yet you respond in love. You respond by serving me. You're doing things that people in your position don't usually do. Why is that? And they get to say, oh, it's because I follow Jesus. And so they get to witness to those in their household, those who are closest to them. And so that's the other, uh, I guess the, the other key thing I think Paul is, is trying to share is this is ha having this posture of humility, um, serving one another, looking to other people's interests, which we see all through uh, Paul's writings, we also see in Jesus' teachings. We see Jesus modeled it. This is how we attract people to Jesus and this is how we live in a mature way. Um, there's a saying, I'm not sure of the original author, but many of you would have heard it. It says, be careful how you live because you're the only Bible that someone may read. You know, we, we represent Jesus uh, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about us being his ambassadors. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation and we are his ambassadors. Do I, do I think about that all the time? No. I, sh I should think about it more. Uh, I'd like to think about it more, but it's, it comes down to me think, taking on my own self-interests and not positioning myself with Jesus as Lord you know, as, as Grace shared, shared about during communion, Jesus in the garden, uh, he surrendered his will to the Father, not thinking about his own interests as your will be, be done. We just sung that song, yet not I, but it's Christ in me. And maybe that's, that can be the, the song that you play on repeat this week, yet not I, but Christ in me. So I've got an amazing uh, diagram to show you. 
Um, this is, this is the, the level of my creativity. Uh, but that's you in the middle, that little uh, stick image. Uh, and we've got these relationships. We've all got relationships. We've got relationships with family, friends, colleagues at work, uh, our neighbours, um, you know, the, the, your, your barista at the coffee shop, you know, whatever relationship it is. We've all got these relationships, and, and we have the ability to influence others, and other people have the ability to influence us. And so what I want to invite you to do is to consider your relationships and just ask which of those relationships are the ones that are really driving me right now? Are the ones that are, um, are changing the way I live in my lifestyle? Is it my family? And it's from the influence of my family that all of the other relationships are happening. Is it work? Is it work that is just consuming me and now it's work that is then spilling out into my, my, my faith, my, my connection with Jesus? So I just invite you to, to consider your relationships this week. Just ask the Holy Spirit to say, which relationships are going really well? Which are healthy? Which are uh, appropriate? And maybe which ones need some work? Think back to the scripture. As a, as a husband, what's your relationship like with your wife? As a wife, what's your relationship like with your husband? What's your relationship like as parents with your children? What's your relationship like with your employees or, or your employer? And just ask the Spirit to, to reveal if there's anything he wants to do within you, anything he wants to bring, um, not in the other person, but in you. That correction, that Jesus in us, which then gets to overflow to everyone else who is around us. It all starts with us surrendering to Jesus as our Lord. As Christians, our relationship with Jesus is, it has to be the defining one. And that's what Paul said this, as he lays out this household code. It's a clear example that Jesus is Lord of that household and all the other relationships fall into place uh, in a way that's healthy, in a way that's mature, in a way that represents Jesus uh, in a really good way. So I'd love to pray for us all. Jesus, thank you for your example. Uh, thank you that you modeled this uh, so well in your life. Uh, this, this level of humility, this level of surrender. And God, help us uh, to, to put off our old life, those things that, that, that call back to us. But Lord, to, to focus our attention on you and put on the new things, those fruits of the Spirit, the compassion, the kindness, the love. And Lord, may, as we surrender to you and you transform our hearts, as you transform us from the inside, may that then overflow into all of our relationships. Uh, Lord, I pray for, for people who have some tense relationships, uh, some relationships that aren't going well. Lord, I pray this week, Lord, that you will bring uh, your will into those relationships. Lord, you'll bring your peace. Lord, you'll bring your wisdom of, of what to do to, uh, to repair or whether it's appropriate to repair. So Lord, this week, I just pray that you minister to us, uh, remind us, but ultimately, Lord, uh, lead us and help us to follow you and to honor you through all of our relationships. I pray these things in your powerful name. Amen.